Hello everyone. A quick note, this will be the first episode of Squall Notion, which I will be providing a voiceover for you all. So this video will technically double as a voice reveal, as well as an episode of Squall Loja. Now, I don't promise myself as a very good speaker, but I'll try and make the video worth your while as best I can. Anyway, let's dive into the episode! This is the Mutavolocene period. Following the Nuovocene period is the Mutavolocene, which lasted from 21 million years to 40 million years following Squaloja's initial colonization. The most significant developments in this period are development of near-terrestrial species of sharks, but only the onset of drastic changes in many animal clades. In of course, by analogy comparing Squaloja's time periods to those on Earth, the Mutavolocene period is most similar to the Silurian period of our time. As for the geography of the planet, this is how the continents will have looked throughout the Mutavolocene. While tectonic activity is minimal, as such the continents haven't moved very much, the planet has experienced a drop in sea levels. Indeed, shifts in sea levels are the primary means of global change on Spallorgia. One of the more prosperous groups of animals in the time period, besides the sharks, was the sea slugs, consisting of the nudibranchs descending from the blue dragon sea slug, and the sack of glosses descended from sea hares and leaf sheep. They, the more, they diversified remarkably over the past few million years, and the use of Olocene could very well be considered their heyday. One species of sea slug, a sack of glossum descended from the sea hare, has filled the role of large benthic graves in the waters of the use of Olocene. The Squalosian sea steer, or Malacatorus placidus, was a four foot long animal notable for its recurved rhinophores, which in a way resembled the horns of a bull. In a way, they're much like cattle in a world lifestyle. Although for river sharks still existed at the time, the sea steered avoid competition by mainly grazing on mats of brown algae instead of large fronds of kelp. Many slugs descend from leaf sheep and continue to optimize their phototropic lifestyles, growing larger in the process. The sandy sea ram, or Overlimax Over rugos, likely descended the Nuova Sea weed back was a 7 inch long species whose rhinophores had developed in structures akin to the horns of a big horn sheep. Although they were mainly used for intimidating predators, not butting heads with rivals. Other species under the genus Golalax also exist around this time. Other leaf sheep descendants went on a different evolutionary path. Species like the Crimson Porky Slug, or Histoclinax hemoderma, have adapted their ancestors' kleptoplasty for a different food source, in this case stealing the nematocysts of toxic corals, which are stored in sharpened fronds for defense. As such, the slug fills a role not like a sea urchin on Earth, and dealing with defenses has very few predators despite being a little over two inches. While many sacrilegious and slugs retain the diet of herbivory, a few species have become predatory. A non carnivorous species evolving to regularly eat meat is not uncommon, as seen with the marsupial lion of Australia and cetaceans in general on Earth. Being a meat eating sea hare descent is more than likely. This species, Pseudo-Anomalocarus fatalis, grew up to the size of a beet and conversely evolved to resemble the extinct Anomalocarus from which it gets its name, bearing spined oral tentacles to catch prey and swim down its parapodia. In addition to the Sacaguasins, the blue dragon nudibranchs have underwent a wave of diversification of their own. In particular, Endre's spine wing, or Toxilase Endre, shout out to Endre YT, Underwent a significant behavioral innovation in gliding, much like a flying fish would. Using its extended serrata, this perch sized descendant of the cobalt dragonibranch could move through the air to cover long distances without spending too much energy. Other slime wing species, like T. comachias or the harpoon slime wing, exist alongside this one. Onto the crabs. Although crabs generally remain similar to their ancestors and overall body plan, one species descended from the Chesapeake blue crab, the spiny pollen crab, or spinal corsus cyanomelana, developed short spines on its carapace for defense against predators. About the size of a cantaloupe, it was a journalistic scavenger that ate almost anything they could find, from smaller crabs and shrimp to seaweed, and even the bodies of dead sharks. By now, the sharks will diversify by a staggering degree, and in an aquatic environment so rife with competition, some species will inevitably start making the transition to a more terrestrial existence. With their muscular fins, these sharks are already pretty adapted for land, and more cartilage may accumulate their fins for added structural support and muscle attachment. 
low columns, Salatopodiforms, taxonomically distinct from the more fully aquatic New Hemicillian sharks. On the left is an x ray scan of an epaulette shark and its pectoral fin. You can see the bones clearly, well, not bones because they're cartilage. While on the right is a little sketch I made in Microsoft Paint of a Salatopodiforms pectoral fin, which, can see, which has the more, aforementioned more cartilage. The Salatopodiforms were clay shark descended from the freckled shark of the Nuova Sea. Besides their stronger fins, they are known for being the first sharks and spawn lizards to evolve black slurry, an adaptation for hunting in murky water, similar to great white sharks on Earth. This species, Tomatolania ambulans, was the size of a small bass and a generalist predator that mainly hunted in the water, but supplemented its diet with terrestrial arthropods. It could stay on land for two hours, twice as long as its epaulette ancestors. Sea slugs weren't the only creatures to turn to carnivory. Without much competition, one clay of moss specialized to become aerial predators with sharpened mouth parts and spiked legs, becoming known as the Atrocipapalonids, otherwise known as grazing rope moths. These moths were highly successful and gave rise to many deadly forms, becoming fierce apex predators. This species, Misophonius volans, grew to the size of a small wasp, living somewhat like dragonflies or robberflies on Earth. With the advent of the razor whip moths, many spider species had to adapt to avoid their new competitors. Some, like the self like Rusin Emperantula, or Emperachne australis, simply retained their large body sizes but became nocturnal. This hunter weighed in about 21 kilograms, and its powerful bill would hunt grapple with prey, although it had very weak venom and lacked the ability to climb surfaces. It was largely an ambush predator due to its lack of speed. Nocturnality wasn't the only option the spiders took to avoid the razor whips. Some took to developing fossoriality, or adaptation for digging, with the hamster-sized pale cave claw, Arachnonyx palans, specializing its entire life in specializing in living its entire life underground. Virtually blind, it tunneled through the soil using the enlarged claws on its front pairs of legs, feeling for prey like smaller spiders or springtails with sensitive mechanoreceptors derived from its equivocating hairs, or the hairs tarantulas used for defense. It essentially lived like an arachnid version of a mole. Isopods, while largely similar to the stock that first set foot on Squalosia, had diversified into new niches from classic to tritivores. This species, Ostracolophus cadaverophilus, the skin of its crested head, was a rat-sized scavenger that fed mostly on carrion, particularly whenever remained of the razorweb moths kill. If it got lucky, the isopod could settle upon the carcass of a shark that ended up stranded on land for too long and die from lack of oxygen. That's certainly a more nutritious meal than empty exoskeletons. Concerning the plants of the mutual policy, since plant species haven't diversified to the extent many animal clades have, I won't be covering them as, in as much detail, save for a few species that will be vitally important later. Or, plants in general begin to grow taller in height without trees to outcompete them, with crops like peppers, and lettuce, cranberries, and fataya, or dragon fruit, diversifying into large shrubs and bushes that serve as food and shelter for numerous animal species. A quick side note here, a shrub is any plant me measured between 1.5 feet and 10 feet at mature height, Anything smaller is ground cover, while anything larger is considered a tree. As for the overall ecology, although sharks are still indisputably on the top of the marine food chain, sea slugs have become aquatic mainstays in their own right, taking much wilder routes biologically impossible for the cartilaginous fish. The salatopodiforms at this time were rare and basal, despite the relative lack of competition on land, mostly sticking to semi aquatic niches wherever they could. On the topic of land, the ecosystem has quite changed up quite a bit. The large diurnal spiders and giant gastropods tend to extinction or decline because of the razor whip moths, which usurp them as apex predators due to their speed and powers of flight. However, not much else has changed. Please note that this video doesn't cover all species that lived in the Mutual Holocene, only the ones most important to the plant's history. If you don't understand what I just showed you all, you can always access the Google Doc or the Sporpedia for the project for more detailed information. The link is posted in the description. If you have any questions pertaining to the, to pertaining to the project or otherwise, I will gladly answer to the best of my ability in the comments section. So I, so I encourage you to keep those questions coming. In the next episode, we'll dive into the Tyranno scene where the first fully terrestrial shark species will emerge to compete with the dominant clays and invertebrates there. 
Oh, to see you later.